Thank you. Members of the council and honorable guests, I have the high privilege of presenting to you the mayor of the city of Baltimore, the Honorable Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake. Mr. President, members of the city council, Madam Comptroller, friends, family, and colleagues in government, citizens of Baltimore, thank you for another opportunity to report to you on the state of the city. Today, we commit to building upon our successes and finding solutions to the challenges that we face. I would like to, th to thank the City Council for your partnership and for your dedication to building a better Baltimore. A Baltimore where every community can thrive free of violence, where every citizen has faith in government, where every person has access to a job, and where businesses can grow, where every neighborhood is vibrant, clean, without blight, and where every child receives a quality education. I believe that building a better Baltimore based off of these principles is within reach, and we're making progress every day. That progress will affect our residents today as well as future generations of this city. As we continue our progress, we must also continue to evaluate a topic that is on all of our minds, public safety. I know it is on the minds of our citizens, businesses, and communities, the people in this room, and it is something that is on my mind every hour of every day. I could stand here and spout off statistics that show crime has decreased in major crime categories, such as assaults or robberies or rape, even overall violent crime, that there have been major gains to make this city a safer city. But right or wrong, for better or worse, the measurement that many people judge us by is our homicide rate. Two years ago, we were able to get our homicide rate down to the lowest it has been in a generation. This was a critical benchmark for both my administration and the city's history. But I always believed that we could do better. 197 murders was still 197 too many. We put a lot of emphasis on numbers and stats, year over year, year to date, month over month comparisons, and so on. It's sometimes the best tool we have to measure progress. However, these victims are more than just statistics to me. They are not some abstract figure. They are a loved one's son, daughter, mother, father, friend, and neighbor. I can't tell you how devastating this is. No matter how or why they were killed, every life is precious and every death is a tragedy. Each life that is lost represent a future tragically cut short. A community that is shaken, a family that is shattered by the loss. To the families, please know that I share in your pain, in your loss, and in your grief. As mayor, I am not immune to this violence, nor is the city council president or many of you in this room. Last year, my cousin Jojo was tragically murdered. In 2002, my brother was a victim of a vicious attack, and I will never forget seeing my brother after being attacked just right outside of my door, bleeding from stab wounds. I thought I was about to watch him die right in front of me. I don't want anyone to go through the pain that my family and many other families have experienced. There is no uncaring here. There's no complacency. There is no lack of urgency. We need to do better. 
Our citizens deserve better, and I will take all necessary actions to fight crime in this city. I want to thank the men and the women of the police department for all that they do every day. This is not an easy job. Thank you for your commitment to our city and to the citizens of Baltimore. Together, we have taken action to make our city safer. We are doubling down on our strategy of focusing on the most violent offenders through, strate through strategic partnerships with our local, state, and federal agencies designed to target individuals tied to violence. This partnership is focused on high-value uh, targets using quick-acting, high-level investigations designed to remove the most dangerous offenders from our streets. During the months of September and October, we targeted, investigated, and arrested more than 100 violent repeat offenders and others tied to criminal activity. Moreover, at the beginning of this year, we intensified our efforts by assigning officers to monitor each violent repeat offender. In coordination with our state's attorney, we ensured that each offender is held during bail review and prosecuted accordingly. To enhance our effort on violent repeat offenders, we will implement a program that has seen success in several other cities. Operation Ceasefire will focus on violent repeat offenders and will work directly with community members and law enforcement to make it clear the violence taking place in our communities must end now. There will be severe and swift consequences for any future acts of violence. And if you're genuinely sincere about wanting to change your life, we're here. We're here with resources and the support to assist you in that endeavor. The program will also increase intelligence utilizing an interagency collaboration. The police department, the sheriff's office, they'll join, for, join forces with other local, state, and federal agencies. Each organization will work in unison to restrict a criminal's freedom of movement and their ability to evade capture. This further represents our all-hands-on-deck approach to reducing violence in our city. As we keep our focus on the most violent offenders, we're also adjusting some of our tactics with proactive policing rather than reactive policing. We will aggressively deploy officers and other resources into geographic zones that are experiencing increased violence. At the beginning of this year, we increased the number of enforcement zones from 4 to 17 throughout the city. These zones are patrolled by every officer, not just specialized units. Data tells us where the criminals are, and we're conducting search warrants and drug buys and undercover stings to apprehend these individuals before they get a chance to commit violent crime. <laughs> crime is not stagnant, and criminals are always looking for a way to stay one step ahead of the police. We must continue to improve our ability to turn observations into actionable intelligence. To that end, we have deployed a, a staff commander to our city's watch center. The staff commander will work with a team of analysts to gather and analyze intelligence and help make decisions on when and how to deploy officers and respond in real time to violence. The Baltimore City Police Strategic Plan has laid out a series of recommendations to improve the department and increase public safety, and they are hard at work implementing these recommendations. On top of responding to our current needs, we're also working to modernize our police force. Our department needs technology upgrades. For instance, right now, our officers are spending a good portion of their time completing archaic and time-consuming police reports instead of being visible in the communities that they serve. That's why we've begun to make technological advancements to remotely take and process reports directly from the streets so police officers can spend more time on their beat. We're also negotiating a new contract with the goal of making our police force more nimble and more responsive. 
while reducing overtime and paying more competitively. We need the flexibility to move our officers to the street during peak times when the crime is occurring. And I look forward to working with the FOP to make this happen. I know that this goal is within reach. We just successfully negotiated a groundbreaking new contract with our firefighters. And this is an example of how labor and management can work together to move the department and our city forward. Our crime fighting strategy must also include resources to prevent youth violence. We know that when our young people are out on the streets at night, they're more likely to either become victims of violent crime or perpetrators. Current, currently, our curfew center only operates during the summer months when school is not in session. However, additional resources are needed to make this year round. That is why we're proposing the creation of youth connection centers for teens that violate the city's curfew. The new connection centers will allow minors in violation of our curfew laws to be transported to safe environments until their parents or guardians can arrive to pick them up. While there, the young people and their families will have the opportunity to be connected with services that support and promote positive development for our young people. There's more to come. I will continue to introduce initiatives to support our crime strategy, including programs for at-risk youth and additional interagency coordinating targeting violent repeat offenders. <laughs> Building a safer Baltimore requires all of us to do our part. It is beyond the control of each of us if we act as individuals. Baltimore City Police cannot do it alone. City Hall cannot do it alone. Communities in crisis cannot do it alone. I know that in order to foster the partnership between the community and the police, we must instill trust and confidence in our citizens. We're going to be tough on crime, make no mistake about it, but we're not going to do it at the expense of our neighbors. We can't allow citizens to feel mistreated in their own communities and then expect those same communities to work with us to solve crimes. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> Our increased outreach is working. Citizens' complaints against the department dramatically decreased last year. And in 2013, we also achieved a 300% increase in citizens calling to report helpful tips in fighting crime. In order to aid in those efforts, we will be providing additional funds to Metro Crime Stoppers for increased rewards to encourage more citizens to call and to get guns off of our streets. Ultimately, our success on the crime fight hinges on our ability to work together to promote the value of every human life in every community. And there are many ways that you can get involved. There are many ways that you can make a difference. For instance, you can join your police community relations council. Every district has a CRC and they meet monthly. Or you could participate in a COP walk. <coughs> And it's so important that if you see something or if you know something, that you say something. I am calling on all of Baltimore citizens to help. If we stay silent when a life is lost, we suggest that that life has no value. And I know that we can do better. Bottom line, the loss of life, the violence, the crime, it's unacceptable. I want to assure the citizens of Baltimore that I will do whatever we need to do and make whatever adjustments we need to make along the way to build a safer Baltimore. And building a better Baltimore means ensuring that citizens have confidence and trust in their government. 
We as political leaders must show that we have the courage to lead. Our city doesn't grow if we turn a blind eye to fixing problems that have existed for far too long. Do we put those problems off for another generation to address, or do we lead and build the type of government our citizens deserve? When I first became mayor, we faced a historic budget deficit of $121 million. We had to make some difficult choices to balance the budget. On top of that, the city confronted an additional $165 million problem if left unaddressed. Reforming the fire and police pension system was very challenging, but the result was necessary. Also necessary is the work that we do to improve the fiscal health of our city. When facing a $750 million structural deficit, we crafted the city's first 10-year financial plan. Through action taken to date, the city will close $400 million of that deficit. I've said it before, I say it, I'll say it again. I don't sugarcoat our problems. I don't sweep issues under the rug. Rather, I acknowledge our problem, roll up our sleeves, and continue to work. I vowed that I would be a mayor that would not look the other way or kick the can down the road. I promised that this administration would give the taxpayers a government in which they could have confidence. That's why in 2011, I created the Billing Integrity Unit, which was tasked with finding and correcting tax errors that had existed for decades. Through internal audits, we have identified and corrected well-documented tax credit errors. We've also proposed a program to help make whole some of the citizens who experienced hardship due to these systematic errors. We're creating an automated system that will reduce human errors in the tax collection process. And moreover, this session, we introduced legislation in the General Assembly to use appraisals to better calculate these credits. Similarly, water billing errors have frustrated residents for years. I invested in a new billing system that has significantly increased customer satisfaction. We're also moving from the manual meters to a more accurate and reliable automated meter system. These meters will provide more accurate billing for our residents. And lastly, we will continue working on a reliable speed camera program. We instituted this program at the request of communities who were concerned about drivers speeding through their communities. They were concerned about their kids. Accidents and fatalities were reduced while the cameras were in place. We know that. We also know that our, our setbacks have been frustrating. Some citizens are questioning the integrity of the program. I want to make sure that you understand, whenever my administration was presented with complete, complete information about a faulty camera, those cameras were taken offline, tickets were voided, and refunds issued. We will continue to work with new technologies to provide a program with integrity that our citizens can have full confidence in. These problems weren't created overnight. And I know that citizens understand that government is not perfect. From time to time, mistakes will be made. We will continue to confront our problems head on and take action to ensure citizens have an effective and efficient government. In Baltimore, we have so many things to be proud of. We are creating local jobs, expanding small and local minority-owned businesses, increasing housing availability, and building vibrant, green, and clean communities, all while continuing to eliminate blight. <laughs> Baltimore City is open for business, and Baltimore City has jobs. This year alone, over 1,000 jobs will be available when Amazon opens its new fulfillment center in southeast Baltimore. Over 1,700 jobs will be available at Baltimore's own Horseshoe Casino. And we're proud of our local companies as well, which continue to grow and provide jobs in Baltimore. Companies like Under Armour, Millennial Media, Grove Com Gro Groove Commerce, Pixeligent, and many others.
And let's not forget about our direct construction jobs and the indirect jobs that come through our major projects. Over 4,200 jobs will be created as a result of the red line. An estimated 15,000 construction, permanent, and indirect jobs will come as a result of the New Harbor Point development. And many, many more jobs will come as a result of our 21st century school construction program. These are billion dollar projects. That's billion with a B. I want to thank the Mayor's Office of Employment Development who works every day to promote local hiring and to make sure our city residents are well informed of all the job opportunities available. We know that Baltimore City is growing. Baltimore has added over 1,100 net new residents since 2011. We've added over 4,200 units of new housing since 2010. Additionally, more than 2,700 units are currently under construction, and more than 1,000 units are in the planning phase. The city is working to address increased housing demand for new residents who are, are increasingly seeking to rent instead of buy. And that's why last year I created the Apartment Tax Credit Program to promote the construction of new apartments and the transformation of older, underutilized office buildings into new, vibrant apartments in downtown and in seven targeted neighborhoods throughout the city. The existing program is expected to generate $40 million in city revenue over the next 20 years. Due to the overwhelming demand from neighborhoods and the business community and a couple of council people, I am introducing legislation to create a 10-year apartment tax credit which can be used anywhere in the city. The program's expansion creates incentives for projects in areas that are currently ineligible. And I'm also keeping my commitment to reduce residential property tax, 20 cents by 2020. To date, we have reduced the effective property rate by 11 cents for all owner-occupied homes, which means the average homeowner saw a $220 savings in their property tax bill. We know that small and local businesses are the backbone of our city's economy. Successful, small, local, and minority-owned businesses transform neighborhoods, expand opportunities, create jobs, and grow our city. I'm proud of the leadership and the transformational work of the Mayor's Office of Women and Minority-Owned Business Development. In order to address disparities and to develop an inclusive economic strategy, I assembled a group of leaders and experts on this subject. And in April, the Mayor's Advisory Council on Minority and Women-Owned Business Enterprise released its report, A New Day, A Better Way. This landmark report is a roadmap which, once implemented, will help transform the city's 35-year-old MBEWBE program to accelerate growth and to build capacity for the region's minority and women-owned businesses. And in October, I announced the Mayor's Coalition on Supplier Diversity and Inclusion and have given this coalition oversight responsibility for implementing the Advisory Council's recommendation. In keeping with my vision to grow Baltimore, my ultimate goal is to plant the seeds and to clear the path to create a new generation of minority and women-owned firms that will someday have an annual revenue of $100 million or more. And I know that too often our small businesses find it difficult to access capital with the flexibility of credit terms that they require. That's why last year I launched Be More Micro. This micro loan program offered through the Baltimore Development Corporation offers loans up to $30,000. And this program is working. Over $150,000 has already been committed to nine small business owners throughout our city. And I'm proud to announce today the continuation of this program for a second year with matching funds from our partners at the Maryland Department of Business and Economic Development. In 
In order to grow Baltimore, we must continue to be forward-thinking and to provide innovative programs. Therefore, I've charged the Baltimore Development Corporation with conducting an assessment of the services provided by the Small Business Resource Center. We want to ensure that the resources we are providing meet the changing needs of small business owners. And we're setting the bar high in Baltimore. We want companies that are built to last and here to stay. And I'm very excited about what we're doing for small, local, minority, and women-owned businesses. We won a $900,000 three-year grant from the U.S. Department of Commerce to create a minority business development center right here in Baltimore, the first of its kind in Baltimore. <laughs> the first of its kind in Baltimore. We were the only municipality in the country to ever receive this grant. Our business center will focus on increasing the size, the scale, and the capacity of successful minority business enterprises. Please join me when we celebrate the grand opening of this wonderful opportunity for Baltimore in March. I am confident that with the work of the Advisory Council, the establishment of the new business center in Baltimore, and the enhancement of the Small Business Resource Center, we will build a Baltimore that is a mecca for entrepreneurs. And the budget that I will submit to the Council will continue investments in innovative programs, programs like our Vegas to Value initiative. When I first became mayor, my charge to housing was clear. Get more of Baltimore's vacant and abandoned properties cleaned up, redeveloped, more quickly, efficiently, and economically. Three years later, Vacants to Value is a signature initiative that tears down dilapidated prop properties and takes absentee landlords to task for their irresponsible and reckless behavior. <laughs> to date, our efforts have spurred more than $85 million in private investment in struggling communities throughout our city. We've issued more than 1,500 fines to vacant building owners who simply aren't doing enough to fix or sell their boarded properties. We filed over 1,000 court cases that forced vacant properties to auction so that new owners who are eager to rehabilitate them are given the chance to do so. We've demolished 800 vacants throughout the city. We promoted the rehabilitation of more than 1,100 previously vacant buildings with nearly 500 more under construction. And more than 1,000 vacant buildings are in the hands of responsible people who are redeveloping them. In November, we announced our new Baltimore Home Ownership Incentive Program. I like to call it BHIP. Over the past three years, this renewed and expanded initiative provided nearly 1,500 home buyers with financial assistance totaling almost $12 million. Of these home buyers, 30% are new to Baltimore City. But, but more importantly for me, the majority of our homeowner incentives went to current city residents many of which were purchasing their first home. <laughs> Vacants to Value is taking action to make our communities better, and we will continue to demolish vacant and unsafe structures and hold absentee landlords accountable across our city. <laughs> and we'll also continue to ensure that neighborhoods are cleaner, the strength of Baltimore is our neighborhoods. And we've seen the benefits of mechanical street sweeping. And beginning in this spring, mechanical street sweeping will expand into every community. <laughs> also, this spring, I will launch the Green Pattern Book developed by the Office of Sustainability as a part of the Growing Green Initiative. The Growing Green Initiative is an interagency effort which includes DPW, housing, planning, the Department of Recreation and Parks, and many more. 
The initiative promotes the creation of community spaces to mitigate the negative impacts of vacant properties and set the stage for growing Baltimore. Through these continued efforts, we will build a Baltimore that is safe, that is green, that is clean, and that is free of blight. That is our mission for 2014. I know building better schools and providing quality education for our young people is key to attracting families and to keeping families here in Baltimore City. In the late 90s, Baltimore City public school system was failing. It was failing financially, and it was failing our children academically. My father, who at the time was the chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the House of Delegates, vowed to do something. He was one of the leading architects of the city-state partnership established in 1997, which the school system still operates under today. To say that this partnership was controversial would be an understatement. The debates extended to the city council chamber where I'm standing today. As a young councilwoman, I defended my father's plan, not because he was my father, but because it was the right thing to do for the children of Baltimore. And I know that as he was nearing the end of his life, he was at peace. He was at peace because of the contributions he made to his community, to the city that he loved, and to the future, to the children of Baltimore. I'm sorry. This is a big deal, what we have been able to do. We are building 15 new schools and significantly renovating at least 30 additional schools. This is an amazing feat for the city of Baltimore. The so as the daughter of Pete Rawlings, I knew I had to do something. When I became mayor, I put together a work group that developed creative solutions that required very difficult choices. With the help of the council, we levied a controversial five cent tax on beverages that the industry fought bitterly. Using those resources and others, we pieced together more than $20 million in new funding. Working with our state partners, we challenged the, the state school, the school system to follow suit. The school system said it was uh, you know, both of our problems and we had to do something. We know that for far too long, poor, uh, poor buildings, uh, broken heating systems, unusable bathrooms and water fountains had become the norm. Our children deserved much better. It was a billion dollar problem. And for many years, all people could do was point fingers. The city said it was a state problem. The state said it was a city problem. We knew that it was important to change. One of the things that struck me uh, when my father passed was what Congressman Cummings said about him. He said, a politician worries about the next election. A true statement, statesman worries about the next generation and children yet unborn. And that was Pete Rawlings. As a child who grew up in Poe homes, my father was dedicated to making sure all citizens were provided with better opportunities. I'm sure that with this new school construction, we will be able to build a better school system for generations to come. Real progress requires tough choices. We are expected to be bold, to be honest, and be courageous in our actions. We will build a safer city. We will build a stronger government. We will build a city with jobs and opportunities. We will build a city without blight. We will build a cleaner city. And yes, we will build a world-class school system for future generations. Mr. President, Madam Comptroller, 
members of the city council, and community leaders. I am pleased to report that while we continue to face many changes, the state of our city as strong, is strong and getting stronger every single day. <laughs> to the citizens of Baltimore, I am extremely honored to serve as your mayor. I ask you to join me in this coming year as we work together to build a better Baltimore. Thank you. God bless this city.